Well, it's an old habit, probably one from my childhood. It's terribly difficult to break. I eat very fast. Uh, I really dig in. I like to eat, and I uh, just eat too fast. And um, at different times, I've tried to change this. I found out that Nancy Reagan uh, used to uh, chew every bite of food of hers 50 times before she'd swallow it. She was very thin. I was trying to emulate that. And I realized she was skinny because everything tastes horrible after you've chewed it 50 <laughs> times. So uh, I quit that. And because I eat fast, it's often the case that I've found myself, perhaps you have, sitting down to the table. The food's there. I dig in. I'm getting ready to tell everybody how great that first bite was. And I'm looking around, and they're all sitting and waiting for the hostess to take the first bite. <laughs> and I uh, understand that one of the rudest things that you can do at a dinner table is to eat before everyone has been served, not wait for the hostess to get to the table. And I've been on the short end of that before, too, cooking many meals, as I have. Um, you get it to the table. You know, it takes two hours to get ready. You get all the dishes there, and then sometimes you have to cut up something for someone or feed a baby a little bit. Everybody else goes ahead, and by the time you actually sit down to eat, everybody else is almost done. You're there for a couple minutes, and I'll tell you, you really lose something of the experience when that happens. So uh, a, well, a woman, Patricia Rossi, who wrote a, an etiquette book, said, uh, as she was saying that one of the most important things uh, to do is to wait for, for everyone to be served, says that really all of the etiquette problems about table manners uh, are, are about people focusing on food and not about the other people they're dining with. And she said, the, the focus should be on the relationships around the table. Uh, and so things like ordering difficult to eat food distracts from conversation and relationship building. And gulping food down too fast or too slow doesn't keep pace with the other diners. So eating around a table is meant to be a relationship building, unifying experience. Uh, in the scripture, in 1 Corinthians today, Paul's writing to Christians in a congregation that he helped establish, and he writes a letter to give them advice on how to deal with problems that have happened since he left them, but he's heard about them. Uh, he's moved on to a new missionary location, but he gets reports, and, and the report that he got this time uh, brought to his attention basically kind of a lack of table manners. He typically addresses problems when they come his way by coming right at them head on, identifying who, what the harm is, and then talking about the pr Christian principle that he sees is at stake in it. And then he explains that principle in a way that gives guidance to the community. So this is the last uh, that I'm doing in a sermon on a sermon series on the meaning of Holy Communion. Uh, we see that this table etiquette problem has arisen at the Lord's Supper when they gather together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the things that Paul has to say about it, I think, shed light today uh, just as much as they did almost 2,000 years ago about Holy Communion. Now, the congregation uh, in Corinth was divided into factions uh, of all kinds, and it's not terribly surprising. Corinth was uniquely located. It was a, a major east, west, and north-south trade route. And so it was uh, newly established or reestablished, and it was a very cosmopolitan, entrepreneurial, competitive uh, kind of spirit. It, it was uh, uh, consumerist, and um, there were people there who were all trying to be up-and-comers and, comers and uh, find a way to uh, monetize the trade uh, that was so uh, productive in the Roman Empire. And there were lots of people who had different levels of material wealth as a result. 
Now back in these very, very early days of the church, uh, congregations met in people's homes. And naturally, it needed to be larger homes in order for them to have enough room. And so the, the wealthier members of the congregation, the ones who actually owned homes and large enough homes to have gatherings were the ones who would be hosting them. We know that it's something about this uh, discrepancy in their wealth that was causing problems for the way they were observing the Lord's Supper. Now, it's not exactly clear what the problem was. There are a couple different theories because Paul is talking to people who know what the problem is. He doesn't have to describe it at length. He describes its effect, though, that some among them were humiliated because they had less. And so the factions that were at issue in this practice were ones that were breaking down along the lines of wealth and poverty or relative wealth or lack thereof. So some people think that what was happening was that uh, the Lord's Supper was being observed kind of at the, near the end of the day at, at, at a meal, what might be like a meal time, evening time, and that um, some people uh, in the congregation were actually employed as servants in the homes of others, and they had to work and get the meals done and cleaned up before they could get to the location for the celebration of Lord's Supper, and that um, other people went ahead and started eating without them, and there was not much left around the table for them to be part of. So it was an embarrassment, as you can imagine it would be. Um, and others uh, speculate that actually uh, in, they've excavated some of these Roman houses from the, the time, and there were different rooms. And the layout of the house was generally that there was a very nice dining room that could hold maybe 10 to 12 people that would have a table with uh, couches that you could recline on while you're eating there. And then, then there would be a secondary room that would have a much more modest kind of seating that could hold more people, and then yet even like an overflow space, so that there were real differences between uh, the quality of the accommodations and the food that was offered in each of the different spaces. So when they were coming together for this meal that was also the Lord's Supper celebration, the differences between them were being emphasized. Now, it can be really difficult to honor community and build community. There can be awkward issues uh, between people who have really different amounts of resources. Uh, we used to encounter this uh, every year, having family vacations with, now that we were all grown, six different kids, all had different kinds of occupations, 17 years from oldest to youngest, different stages in life. There were some people who could have afforded to go to resorts, but not everybody could. So we tried to find a place that everybody could afford. And I, I think there were some years when there were people who were probably paying my part so that I could go. And there were other years when we, I've chipped in to pay the part for somebody else at a different stage in life and needing it. And then while you're there, you have, oh, some people want to go out to a dinner and buy all this stuff for the kids. And it's like, I, my kids would come home spoiled. I can't get all that stuff for them. So there, were, there are issues of working together in community and building relationships when people have really different levels of ability to acquire things in life because some of the things that we do together are the ways we relate to each other and it can be easy for people to get left out. So on one level, this congregation was dealing with an issue that is very much present today. In fact, it's a blessing to have a congregation that has a lot of diversity 
of all kinds. And, and even though we don't talk about it as much, the diversity of how much we have, how much comfort is built into our margin of existence, is actually something that can be an obstacle in building community. And I just want you to know we do work at that. We, we try to think about making as much as possible the, the core church activities accessible to as many people as possible. Paul says that the theological principle at heart in their problem is that they are not discerning the body. And what does he mean? I think he means they're not discerning the body appropriately in two ways. First of all, there's just the very simple thing that we've been describing. Paul goes on just a little while later in this letter to talk about the church. You are the body of Christ. So one thing that they are not discerning as they come to celebrate the Lord's Supper and are doing so in a way that makes some people feel less worthy and important than others. One thing they are not doing is they are not discerning the body of Christ in and through each one of them and lifting that up as precious and important. In their inequitable practices, they are not expressing in the Lord's Supper the fundamental value of each precious life in their community for whom Christ died. So they're not discerning the body appropriately. And we can see, we'll go on in a minute and see what Paul instructs them to do, that he tells them how they need to handle that. But there's another sense in which they are not discerning the body he talks to them about every time you take the cup and the bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. They were not appropriately discerning the body of Jesus that they were remembering and celebrating in the Lord's Supper. When you think about that body, you have to think, why did that man who came to serve and not be served, that teacher of love one another, that servant, that prophet, why did that messenger of God die? And when you think back on that, it's because of the sin of the world. And as we imaginatively remember the Last Supper and all that went on around it, we remember the death in the presence of friends who'd betrayed and denied him, of officials who saw no crime in him but stood by while they pacified the crowd, of religious leaders who were jealous or scared of losing their control and couldn't do the right thing. And as I think about that, each time I find also that my sin was there. And remembering that it breaks my pride and self-righteousness all over again. So discerning the body on that occasion is discerning the one who came to serve and to suffer and die for people like me, my sin. At the same time, I remember he came and died for people like me, that we might have new life what an incredible gift. It's both sombering and incredibly humbling and a source for deep gratitude. Well, there's one thing that I imagine that uh, if we could do, we might grasp, uh, in my head I, I get this picture, if we could grasp the the discerning the body of, of believers together. 
and how important it is that what it is that holds us together is not anything about our external circumstances. It is about the faith we proclaim in the one who died to save sinners and give them new life. I wish that all of you in every other row could flip your chairs around and pretend there's a table between each and every one of you. And if we could take the pews and do the same thing upstairs so that you had a communion meal right across the table from each other. It might help us discern, discern the body better. And when you think about it in that way, and you realize that there were real inequalities going on at the tables where they were also celebrating the Lord's Supper back in Corinth, you realize how far astray they'd gone from that celebrating the death of that humble servant. Then I have another little fantasy. You'll see today that we are going to have our communion in these little cups, the old-fashioned way. And we're going to do that kind of in, in, in specific intention to keep one aspect of Paul's instructions. And when we have these little cups, uh, the very first time I took communion, by the way, was when I got confirmed in seventh grade. And I distinctly remember being in the pews and we took these cups. And of course, we always had a very somber tone to it. But when we, I understood what it meant. And, and the first time I had this, when I got done with that cup, you know what I wanted to do? I want, I'd seen those movies where they have the toast to life and they make a toast and they throw it against the thing. And I wanted to take it and heave it against the altar. This covenant is done. This new covenant. And every time you take this cup, you're proclaiming your loyalty to the one who came to die for us and sinners like us. To give us new life. Lachaim, to life, right? I think that that's why they no longer use glass cups. <laughs> These are plastic cups. But your participation in communion is your profession of faith. Every time you take the cup and, yeah, I better take that one myself. <laughs> You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when Paul talks to them about examining themselves, he's asking them to think deeply about what this means to them. Because thinking deeply about that meaning and really coming to terms with the reality therapy of who we are gives us the opportunity to really receive the wonderful gift of grace and love and forgiveness that is given in this each and every time. So if we'd read on, Paul says, so then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you're hungry, if you are used to eating earlier and you can't wait, go ahead and eat at home. But then... When you come together, make it be a celebration of unity in relationship with God and with one another as the body of Christ. So today, we are going to have communion not by intinction, which has a wonderful symbolism of God's grace is available to all, but we do need to move forward to receive it as we're able. Today, we are going to all receive the elements and take them at the exact same time. The ushers will serve you bread first, and then we'll hold on to it until John gives the words, and then we will share all the same time, just as a symbol of our unity, and on World Communion Sunday, with all who believe in Christ. And then we'll receive the cup, and we'll pass that around and uh, 
since we're going to be holding it until everyone has it, parents, you may want to hold on to that little cup for kids. And then the ushers will pass the baskets and we'll collect them. And we won't do it all the time because there's really wonderful symbolism in all the different ways that we can receive communion. But I thought on World Communion Sunday, when we're thinking about the gift of unity in Christ, that it would be good today to do so. So uh, don't throw your glass, but lift it up and think to life. Amen.